Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm sorry about that. We're a little bit late. Um, just a few technical issues just to start with, but um, everything seems to be up and running now. So yeah, thanks everyone for, for taking the time to tune in tonight. Um, and we're looking at uh, the damage feral pigs do to your hip pocket. Um, it uh, basically looks at uh, what pigs are costing you and your individual enterprises. Uh, I just need to start with um, acknowledging the traditional custodians of, on the land on which we meet today, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, just in the way of introductions, uh, my name's David Lindsay, I'm a Senior Biosecurity Officer with the Northwest Local Land Services. Uh, been in this job now for about 28 years and had a lot of experience with uh, control of feral pigs over that time. And one of the problems I've encountered uh, when trying to emphasise the extent of pig damage uh, was that very few landholders uh, had taken the time to put a dollar figure on the damage that pigs have caused on their properties. So they sort of had an idea, uh, but, but never really put a figure on it. So the reduction of, of um, yields and, and number of lambs and how much it actually cost to control pigs. Um, although they sort of had rough ideas, they never really had anything um, um, concrete. Uh, and without that information, it becomes pretty hard to compare your control, uh, the cost of your control to the return on your investment and then what's happening from year to year. Um, so to help land, landholders get their heads around it, we approached Agicon to uh, get some figures for us. Um, it's quite a large undertaking, as you can imagine, given all the variables with commodity prices and yields and all that sort of stuff. So there's, there's a lot of variables out there. Nagagon have done a great job, and in particular our uh, speaker tonight, Janine Power. Uh, Janine is an agricultural economist based on a farm near Burren Junction in northern New South Wales. Of Northwestern New South Wales. She specialises in investment and impact analysis, feasibility of new technologies and whole farm modelling. In addition to investigating the economic impacts of feral pigs and other consulting work, Janine and her husband run a mixed farming business which includes broad acre uh, irrigation and dry land farming plus livestock enterprises. Uh, she has direct experience with most of the methods feral, uh, of feral pig control we'll discuss today. Um, on the right side of your box there is, uh, on the right side of your screen, there's a, a box there that uh, has questions on it. So if anyone has any questions, uh, by all means type those in um, and we'll get those. But we will leave those till the end of the of the uh, presentation and I think we'll look at them then just so that the presentation can, can go through and at the conclusion as you leave there'll be a few questions will pop up um, please help us by answering those um, gives us a little bit of feedback and we know how we're going with this stuff and help to improve it in the future and you also get an email uh, probably tomorrow sometime with a lot of contact uh, contacts and information that we discussed tonight so i think that's everything uh, so without further ado i will hand over to janine Thank you, Janine. Uh, all right, by the way, I will actually um, turn off my webcam so that um, we can use a computer uh, without sort of clogging it up too much. Um, so I'll leave it there and uh, thank you, Janine. Thanks a lot, Dave. I'm going to do the same. I'm going to turn off my webcam and it will just reduce the bandwidth for this webinar, which hopefully will mean it will run a bit smoother. So I'll pop that off. And we'll make a start. It's been estimated that the cost of feral pigs to agriculture in New South Wales is in excess of $13 million a year, which is a pretty considerable amount. Where the damage is coming from, it was estimated from both cropping and livestock, in particular those costs for cropping. It's rooting up the freshly planted seeds, the seedlings, chewing on the plants, using the crop as a habitat or even nesting in it when it's a taller crop such as uh, sorghum, corn, 
and even cotton fibre beans. In, for livestock, lamb predation is a main issue where the feral pigs will prey on young lambs and kill them. The pigs are also a huge biosecurity threat as they can be host for a range of disease. And on top of that, they'll eat out of feeders, eat improved pastures and cause damage to waterways and with their wallowing and in for other environmental damage, they even prey on a range of natives and cause additional damage to infrastructure such as fences and dams. They're quite a successful vertebrate pet because they are pest, not pet, pest because they're so robust and they can adapt to various habitats and environments really well. On the screen, you'll see that I've said the sows can have up to two litters in a year and at an average of six piglets per litter, that's a really rapid increase of population. So it just shows what an issue that the feral pig population can become and how quickly it can become one. In northwest New South Wales, you can see on the map, we've already got a fairly high abundance in our region. You'll see by the darker blues that there's either high or a medium abundance of feral pigs in our area. So all of that collectively shows that a sustained and continued control pro program is very important. I'm going to jump straight through to the, the cost of feral pigs, what they could be costing you per hectare for each of the enterprises. You can see a range of enterprises there with chickpeas potentially suffering up to $100 a hectare from feral pigs. Now this is up to, so you're probably thinking now, well up to, how's that calculated? What's the typical amount? What's the average? And so we'll go from here to looking at basically a bit of background on how we calculated these numbers. The economic benefit of controlling feral pigs comes down to the avoided value of yield losses. So those losses that I showed on the previous screen, less the control costs. We looked at quite a few enterprises in Northwest New South Wales, and they were the more common ones. And in terms of ABS data, collectively had the higher value for the region. So there's a, a few different winter crops there, some summer cropping and also sheep enterprises in terms of meat and wool. The control options we assessed were the most common being baiting, trapping, aerial shooting, ground shooting and exclusion fencing. The Variables within the analysis, as Dave said, made it quite complex. So the variables being the typical yields or the yields that would have otherwise occurred without the feral pig damage, the yield loss caused by the feral pigs, the commodity prices that would be achieved, the cost of the control and the effectiveness of the control method. So for each of these variables, we created a distribution so that we just didn't use a static figure. We wanted to look at what were the range of possibilities and what was the probability of something happening. So for example, in terms of yield loss in chickpeas, you can see that the graph is skewed to the less left. So that means that more often, the prob it will be probable that you'll get the lower end of the damage, but still in some instances, there can be higher damage. The yield loss caused by feral pigs, we use the data of, you, we did a survey and we use a range of published materials to get an understanding of 
basically what the background would be and how to create this probability distribution. So for yields, we used ABS data. Yield loss was the survey and the published materials. For commodity prices, we used ABARES data, a data set of 20 years to look at the full range of pricing. For the cost of each control method, we surveyed and used published materials and the same for the effectiveness of the control method. So we ended up with 30 of these complex little probability distribution graphs and they were what were used in our calculation so that we did we took into account not only just average yields and average prices but also the probability of a certain price occurring and making sure that we really captured the range. For the survey which was some of our most valuable data to create the distribution maps and for the calculations. We put an electronic survey out to all uh, land, land managers in northwest New South Wales. We had a good response of just under 130 land managers. As you can see here, the little black men um, or persons, uh, they a representative of where the responses came from. So we had a pretty good spread around the region. The enterprises found on each respondent's farm, we had a pretty good coverage of cereals, course, which included corn and sorghum, so there'd be wheat and barley as well, pulses, plus the favour beans, cotton, sheep and cattle. Additionally, the, we asked about estimated losses for, and the respondents showed that corn suffered some of the lesser damage. And I mean, the work that, with everything, there's instances of higher damage there as well. Barley and wheat were also quite low. Uh, then cotton and cotton was mid-range with chickpeas and faba beans suffering quite higher damage. In terms of livestock, you could see hay paddocks, so where the hay is grown and before it's baled essentially, received probably some of the lower end of damage. Then the lamb mortality is a key issue, but it's also a high incidence of eating grain out of feeders. As I mentioned before, there's always a range and it was most notable with the lamb losses, with one respondent noting 60% of losses and then others saying they've had none. So 60% lamb losses is certainly at the extreme end of damage. We, as I said, we asked about the effectiveness of the control methods and exclusion fencing came out as highly effective as can be expected, which I'll talk about exclusion fencing, focusing on its own a bit later on because it's the only non-lethal method and it's also a high upfront cost with a long-term investment. So it does need to be considered slightly um, different to the other methods. Ground baiting and aerial shooting were noted as quite highly effective methods. Ground shooting was noted as the least effective and trapping came in under aerial shooting and 1080 baiting. So they were from the survey that results, we combined that information with published information to get our distribution on the effectiveness of each control method. And as one of our respondents said, all techniques are useful in their different applications and it is necessary to use a combination of them. Whilst ground shooting is technically the least effective in some situations such as 
harvest when their habitat is being removed. It can be quite handy to do rapid eradication on immediate sightings. I'm going to go through just a couple of examples of specific enterprises to give you an example of the results. So for cotton, you'll see a box whisker plot. We have the uh, key over here, if you're not familiar with box whisker plots. So the box itself shows uh, the range of 50% of results. The lines basically show the complete range of results with an extra 20% of the top results at the top and 20% of the bottom. It also, show, also shows if the results are skewed to one end. For example, most of our results have a long tail or upper end of potential benefits. So what I'm seeing here is that potential benefits can be up to $70 a hectare with cotton, which is significant over large hectares. I'm seeing that the baiting and aerial shooting are both completely above the zero line. So if there is a tail or part of the result below zero, it means that the cost of the control method, so in these, it's exclusion fencing and ground shooting, the cost of those control methods sometimes wouldn't justify or the, the benefits received from them wouldn't justify the cost. So where there is very low anticipated yields and very low pig pressure and potentially very low commodity prices, the cost of an exclusion fence um, isn't outweighed by the benefits. But most of the time, with all of the methods, there is a benefit to feral pig control. And whilst this is a single season snapshot, we also need to remember that these benefits would be ongoing for other enterprises. So you might be focusing around your cotton crop or your some, some of your summer crops for control, and then you're going to get the flow on benefits for your winter crops with a suppressed number and less damage. So it's pretty challenging to look at, but what we have really focused on is the single crop. So to note again, the exclusion fencing, we modelled it as an annualised cost. So basically the total cost divided by the number of years. And this is showing for cotton owned for a single year. So, and this is the cotton crop. Obviously an area isn't going to be solid cotton for 25 years. Well, it shouldn't be. And there are going to be a number of crop rotations. So consideration needs to be given to how often the area might be fallow and what other crops might be grown in rotation and the overall life of the fence you would see far less returns than that. I'm sure I can show you here. The results are quite sensitive to the anticipated yields so you're going to receive higher benefits with higher yields uh, because it is it's taking a large number of tonnes with the damage. The yield loss due to the feral pigs, obviously the more damage they're doing, the better, bigger benefit you're going to receive from controlling the pigs. That isn't to say wait until they're wrecking half your crop until you damage them so you get the best benefit. Clearly the highest benefit is keeping them suppressed and avoiding those large yield losses. Commodity prices, the higher the value, obviously the bigger the value of the benefit. The control method effectiveness is really a big one. And I'll just flip back to cotton to show. The differences here in this cotton graph are largely the effectiveness of each control method. Exclusion fencing is highly effective, but the cost kind of brings it down slightly. Aerial shooting and baiting, both highly effective, and they are 
the sit higher, so have the highest benefits. Trapping would be the next most effective and ground shooting on average the least effective. So the control method effectiveness is very sensitive for these results. And if you're using the controls in a highly effective situation, for example, at harvest with ground shooting, it's most certainly worth using that control and each control does have its place. The cost of the control method is also important and the results would move around with change cost. So now we're looking at a different crop, we're looking at wheat, a winter crop obviously, we've got another box whisker plot and you can see of note compared to cotton, we've got most of exclusion fencing is sitting here as a negative net benefit, suggesting that the benefits of putting in an exclusion, exclusion fence, specifically for wheat, would not outweigh the costs. The same as ground shooting. Mostly that is comes down to wheat in our distributions, they suffered lesser damage to cotton, so if you're comparing the results. And the cost of the um, ground shooting, this less effectiveness, it just doesn't outweigh the benefits that you can get. So the benefits are a bit smaller because it's a lower value commodity. So up to $23 a hectare, which certainly can still add up over a large amount of hectares. The yield losses will be in this higher range where the estimated damage to the yield is over 2.5% of yield. If you're expecting the pigs are doing that much damage, you're certainly going to be getting huge benefits for controlling them. Where the yields are greater than two tonnes a hectare, the value of the yield losses are obviously going to be higher with pigs in there. And when the value of the commodity is over $225 a tonne. So it could be a combination of those factors. So I've put those in and all of this information for all the commodities is in the full report, which I'll put a link to at the end of the presentation. I've put those in so that you can have a look and think, oh, roughly where would I be sitting? I mean, am I up here at the top of the range? Am I at the bottom? Uh, what, am I, what am I thinking my losses are? What is my rough tonnage? And you should be able to get an indication of what you think the benefits would be to controlling the pigs or what the losses you are suffering. Popping in sheep here too, so that we can have a look for the livestock. It, we've got exclusion fencing coming out higher and I'll, basically we did a bit of a scenario on that, assuming that the exclusion fencing was only applied to lambing paddocks at a total of 150 kilometres of fencing. The exclusion fencing result was not cost effective if it was applied to the whole area. So once again, we've got baiting and aerial shooting showing high benefits. And that is basically across the board with all the enterprises, they were the most cost effective control methods. Trapping also showed some good results and we're seeing results um, up here as 18, up to $18 a hectare, but more typically around the five, $5 a hectare, which once again can add up. By look and focus on aerial shooting, which was one of the quite cost effective methods, you can see here that the upper end of the benefits is quite significant. But on average, they're still showing strong benefits across most crops. And what that comes down to is that it is such an effective control method. The it does have a large range of costs. So the lower the pig population would result in longer flying time and a greater cost per pig. It's also not as effective in when there's periods of really dense um, vegetative matter. If you can't see the ground, it's difficult to see the pigs. 
Also, one thing to note is area-wide shoots can really create cost efficiency, which will increase the benefits. Baiting, uh, which is the 1080 baiting, is basically when the poison is applied to a baiting matter, which would be in the picture, you can see it's wheat or a type of grain. That is left out. The most effective, it is a quite an effective method, but it becomes more effective when there is a period of free feeding beforehand for a number of days. It's quite a low cost control option and made even more so when regularly the New South Wales LLS promotes feral pig control by providing free 1080 and even potentially grain for baiting. So it really minimises the cost and would increase that average benefit. You can see that the 1080 baiting also has quite high average benefits per hectare. Oh, got flying time noted in there, which is not clearly not relevant. Your costs for the 1080 baiting comes down to the poison, which you can often get as part of a control program, the grain, which often most farmers would have on hand, and then the labour in terms of doing the free feeding and monitoring. For trapping is a very effective control method. You can see benefits of up to $70 a hectare and on average still positive benefits across all of the different enterprises. The cost of trapping largely comes down to labour time. Lots of farmers might be thinking well, I'm doing it myself, so it doesn't cost anything, but everybody's time is valued at something. So we have included the labour component in that. It's particularly a useful method when there is areas of high pig activity and baiting might not be suitable. A period of free, free feeding um, is also helpful and has been shown to increase the effectiveness of trapping. Ground shooting by licensed pig shooters is actually the most commonly used lethal control method and it's also noted as the least effective, mostly because it, it has a tendency to scatter the population. Once you're in there and you've taken a few shots, uh, the population, not surprisingly, scatters and it makes it quite difficult to control, uh, get high control um, effectiveness. So it can be quite labour intensive per pig, but it certainly does have its uses in specific um, situations or just to, just to eradicate pigs as they are sighted. Um, the harvest was a noted time where it could be particularly useful. You can see here in terms of the average benefit that it is marginal and that would be more for a routine, if, if ground shooting was relied on as your single routine control option, it would end up being quite labour intensive but all of the control methods are pretty good when they are combined together. So if ground shooting might support baiting or aerial sh shooting and even trapping. The exclusion fencing I noted before was different. It has varied benefits and basically it comes down to it is very expensive. It has a high upfront cost and the costs do vary, but they'll come in at approximately $15,000 at a kilometre. So it's quite specific fencing, the exclusion fencing. It's also different that this fencing will move the pest population elsewhere rather than eradicate it. So it's at odds with area-wide management. Uh, it mightn't make you super popular with your neighbours if they don't have it and there's a, a high pig problem. However, it 
does give high returns in some specific scenarios. So if it's productive areas, so lambing paddocks was a particular one where exclusion fencing gave a good benefit. But also if there's other highly productive areas or to minimise the damage of areas along waterways. I guess obviously you'd need to weigh up if flooding is going to damage the fencing, but it's so effective that there are most definitely times when exclusion fencing would be useful. So what I've tried to do is keep my presenting, I guess, quite concise to give everybody a lot of time to ask some questions. I've got, can bring up other graphs or can talk to specific questions and specific scenarios. There is a lot more information. Um, this was just summarised from the full study, which was cost benefit analysis of feral pig control in our area. Um, LLS funded that study, it's available the full report's available on their website. There is summary reports on, on there as well, little summary fact sheets. The summary fact sheets by control option. There is also a summary fact sheet by enterprise. We've got all the summer enterprises up and the winter ones will be popping up on the website shortly. So as Dave mentioned, in your email that you receive in the next day or so, you'll have direct links, but if you wanna have a look, you can pop onto the website there. There's a phone number there for your local LLS to see if there's area-wide management strategies happening. It's where I've shown the per hectare benefits is considering, I guess, a single enterprise in a single year. The flow and effects of area-wide management are so important because feral pigs can have a large range of habitat and if it just makes a whole lot of sense to cover the largest area as possible to get that suppression of the population. If you're interested in standard operating procedures for the control methods, uh, you can look on the PestSmart website they outline each control method and run through some in-depth of what the methods are, how they work and give you a standard operating procedure, which could be helpful. Um, if anybody got some questions, we can type them into the chat bar on your right and see if I can answer those for you. So there's a couple of questions there now, uh, Janine. Uh, can you see them from your side? I actually can't at the minute. Maybe would you like to read those okay, out? Okay, I've got those. So there's the uh, first one here from John. Uh, how did Agicon separate out exclusion fencing costs, damages of feral pigs when other feral, feral such as roos, foxes, preying on lambs and deer that would be eliminated at the same time? So basically what we did, it's a good question because exclusion fencing does exclude a number of pests, not just pigs, obviously. So we looked at the value of the benefit for the pigs. So there would be additional value if you were sustaining damage from other pest animals. I'll pop back to the wheat exam or the sheep example for, so, the exclusion fencing here was based on avoiding the lamb losses in this scenario from feral pigs. And that was just purely from feral pigs. So you could value what your lamb losses from other pests are, you know, foxes or wild dogs or whatever it may be, you could value that on top as an additional benefit. And in many cases, it, it could be an additional benefit there. Okay, uh, and then there's another one here from John as well. Um, and it's good that you're on the sheep one at the moment because it's, it's uh, what about uh, lambs at the current prices? 
200 to $300 uh, sheep are gold-plated ATMs. Well, so as the, the value of sheep go up, you are seeing your benefits come higher along the results. So I used averaging and averaging prices or would be typically here. But when you consider the whole range of pricing, the higher when the commodity in this instance, the lambs are valued basically at the top of their range, you would have to expect that your benefits are going to be towards the top of the range as well. Okay, well that seems to be the only two questions we've got at the moment. There's still uh, quite a few people on there at the moment. So if uh, anyone's there that uh, has any more questions or, or wants to know any information, by all means um, put that in there now. Um, um, Apart from that, um, was there anything else you wanted to add, Janine? I'm trying to think. It was, it's a very lengthy report that I've summarised into these slides. I didn't want to get too technical in terms of the methodology and some of the calculations. All that information is in the report for those people that want to understand exactly how the numbers were calculated. I think, I mean, I really did cover it, but I guess the key points are that each control option does have its place, but in general, it was the aerial shooting and the baiting that were overall quite highly effective. And there are ongoing costs, um, sorry, there are ongoing benefits across seasons when you consider a an ongoing and considered control program that might include various control options and particularly with area-wide management being considered as well. So joining in with neighbours and trying to get to cover as wide an area to really suppress the population. Did you, you've experienced uh, feral pig damage and control yourself, Dave? Did you have any um, yeah, other things you'd like to note? Or? Uh, no, I think everything's pretty good. Um, I will note that, that uh, the initial report with all the stuff in it that's, that's up on those websites is really comprehensive. It has a lot of information in it that's really good. Um, there's also those, um, uh, just the, the fact sheets for individual enterprises, so all that stuff will be there for everyone to have a look at. Um, I will note that um, we talked about, you know, free feeding of the pigs. It is a legal requirement to um, um, uh, to do three free feeds. Uh, it's not the minimum. Like you can go more than that if you wish, uh, but you must do at least three free feeds when you when you're doing your pigs. Um, and um, Yes, uh, but but feeding for a while, for a period of time, um, there has been some surveys done, um, and you know they've worked out that the longer you feed for, you can actually uh, encourage more pigs in over a period of time and and uh, get a far better result. But uh, you know you've got to weigh that up against the, the fact that you know you may lose your your pigs in the process as well. They could just sort of disappear. Here's another question that's come in here now. Um, is there any particular exclusion fencing type or brand that you would recommend? I'm personally not a control expert. I guess as an economist, I just collected numbers and wasn't looking at particular brands. So I does the LLS have any recommendations along those lines? <laughs> no, Dave? look. It, it really depends on what you're trying to um, to um, keep out. And as John pointed out earlier, um, there's lots of other animals that can be coming through as well. So, you know, your standard, if you want to make sure you're keeping out dogs and foxes, your standard has to be a lot higher than just if you've got roos and pigs. Um, so it really depends on your enterprise, what you're trying to keep out uh, and uh, yeah, what you're trying to protect, I suppose. So, yeah, it'd be, It'd be a matter of actually looking at those. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have AgQuip this year, but it's quite a few different types turn up at AgQuip each year, and it'd be a matter of just looking and seeing what suits your particular 
uh, particular ground. Uh, so another question in there, um, back to the beginning, 139 responses is a good return. What do you put such a good uh, response down to? I think that the response rate was partly because we tried to keep the survey was online so it was easy to complete. It was a short survey, um, only took a couple of minutes to fill in and it was distributed by a number of I'd say trusted um, resort, uh, organisations, so the LLS sent it out and there was a, a number of organisations that sent it out to, I guess, their members, so when it comes from a trusted organisation, but probably the convenience of being able to fill it out quickly on a phone or if they're checking emails on a phone, can click on it, no, it's only a couple of minutes and they think that they've got time to do it. The feral pigs seem to be the most interest of any of our social posts, um, perhaps because they're novel, but also because it is a real problem. It's actually something not related that I thought I should mention as well in terms of the aerial shooting control option. Uh, what's most important to the high benefits on that one is that it's highly effective. So some landholders like the novelty of shooting themselves if they're correctly licensed, but when you're using a professional and experienced shooter, you're more likely to get higher amounts and more humane shots in to get a higher kill, which is going to give you the highest benefits. Okay, um, we might mention that there will be some more surveys. Um, you're going to be doing some surveying uh, into the future. So um, if we can organise it, we might be able to, if anyone in the audience is, is um, keen to participate in those um, surveys, it'd be great to get any of that information in. So uh, we'll see how we go about getting some of those, um, or a link to one of those questionnaires when uh, later on when, uh, when that's all sorted and uh, out to everyone. Yes, we're wanting to look at season specific damage. So uh, last winter, we'll look at 2020 winter, the summer we've just had, and then for the next three years compare. And what we're hoping that we'll see is that the population or abundance may be reducing with an increase, due to an increased amount of control. It's gonna be challenging because it is a good season, which is providing what the pigs need for their ideal environment, which means they will be breeding as quick as they can. So it's another reason to really get on top of control and start implementing uh, control programs. Okay, well, uh, that seems to be the end of the questions. Um, uh, we've We've probably only got 10 minutes left, so I'd imagine that, um, um, yeah, uh, unless anyone's got any very pressing right now, I'd um, just like to thank everyone for giving up a bit of time to come and um, have, a, um, have a listen and, uh, and, and see what it's all about. So I hope you're able to uh, gather a bit of information out of that, that that's going to help you with your enterprise and, and maybe make some decisions around how you're going to do your um, um, control programs into the future. Um, and if you need any more information, uh, please feel free to contact us via the links um, that'll come up in that email. Um, and uh, yeah, I think um, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, uh, yep, I um, just got a thanks for the presentation. So that's great. Thanks, Tim. Oh, good. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thanks, everyone. I'll, um, I'll finish it up at that and um, uh, yeah, by all means, contact your local land services if you uh, want to do something with some feral pigs in your area. Thank you.